This video will cover examination of the knee. It will revise basic knee anatomy, demonstrate a systematic approach to the examination, and the various manoeuvres used to assess function and detect pathology. The knee joint is a hinge joint. The menisci, located on the tibial plateau, provide a more congruent surface for interaction with the femoral condyles. Structures which help to stabilise the joint include the collateral and cruciate ligaments. As with any examination, wash your hands, introduce yourself to the patient and ask for permission to examine them. Make sure they are not in any pain and start with them in the correct position, standing up with adequate exposure. Ideally, one joint above and below should be exposed, as well as the opposite side to allow for comparison. Begin by assessing the patient's general condition. For example, are they well or unwell? Are there any associated injuries? or have any treatments been given. The rest of the examination involves assessing the joint using the three main domains of looking, feeling and moving. The first part of the examination involves a thorough inspection of the front, side and back of the joint. The skin, soft tissues and bones should all be assessed in turn. Within the skin, you may detect scars, erythema or lacerations. Looking at the soft tissue, try to assess for an effusion, most easily detected by absence of the dimple on the medial side of the patella. Muscle wasting of the quadriceps may also be evident, especially of the vastus medialis. Finally, look at the alignment of each knee. In varus deformity or bow legs, the tibia is deviated medially with respect to the femur at the knee joint. This is usually due to the medial side of the joint being affected by osteoarthritis. In valgus deformity, or knock knees, the legs splay out laterally when the lateral side of the joint is affected, usually by rheumatoid arthritis. Ask the patient to turn around and inspect the side of the knee. In particular, a fixed flexion deformity may be easier to see from this angle. This is a position of comfort for the joint and may occur secondary to acute infection or inflammation. Genu recurvatum, also known as knee hyperextension, may be easier to identify as well. Lastly, have a look at the back of the knee, so as to detect any swellings such as Baker's cyst or popliteal aneurysms. After inspection, ask the patient to walk and assess their gait for any abnormalities. An antalgic gait with a short stance phase on the affected side may be a common finding. Look at the front, side and back of the knee joint, covering these points systematically. Remember to assess the patient's gait. It is very important to check the neurovascular status of the limb being examined. This can be done by assessing sensation, palpating the pulses and estimating the capillary refill time. Using a similar system, we feel the skin, palpate the soft tissues and bones for any abnormalities. The skin is felt with the back of the hand to assess the temperature of the joint. A comparatively warm joint may indicate an underlying inflammatory process. A cold limb may point towards nerve or vascular damage. The soft tissues are felt to detect an effusion. There are many ways of doing this, but the stroke test is the most sensitive and will therefore be demonstrated. Fluid is milked from the medial side of the knee up into the suprapatellar pouch. Then watching the medial side of the knee, the fluid is stroked back. As the fluid returns, the dimple on the medial side of the knee will pop out. The fluid can also be encouraged to move to the lateral aspect of the knee, and then back to the medial aspect. To feel the bony margins of the joint, it would be advisable to flex the knees to 90 degrees and ensure the patient is comfortable throughout. Start off at the tibial crest. Move on to the tibial tuberosity and the patella tendon. Feel the patella margin and for the quadriceps insertion before moving on to the collateral ligaments and joint capsule. Tenderness may be localised to tendon origins or insertions. Remember to palpate behind the knee for any aneurysms or cysts. When palpating, remember to keep looking at the patient's face to ensure they are comfortable. Compare your findings with the other knee. When assessing movements of the knee, both sides must be compared. Observe active movement, 
and then evaluate passive movements if appropriate. Examine extension of the knee, followed by flexion as shown. The normal range of motion is between 0 and 140 degrees, but this varies between individuals. One hand can be put over the joint to feel for any crepitus during passive and active movement. In order to test specific structures, there are some special tests which can be used. A more sensitive way to detect quadriceps weakness is to perform the lag test. The patient is asked to lift their leg 10 centimeters off the bed. The patient should be able to do this even with a very weak quadriceps. They are then asked to bend their knee by 20 degrees and straighten it again. If the quadriceps is weak, they will be unable to straighten the leg and return it to its original extension. To assess the cruciate ligaments, leave the knees bent at right angles and compare the two tibial tuberosities. If they are not at the same level and there is posterior sag on one side, this may indicate a posterior cruciate ligament problem. To test the anterior cruciate ligaments, the anterior draw test can be used. After ensuring the patient has no foot pain, sit on the patient's feet for stability and place your fingers in the popliteal fossa and thumbs on the tibial tuberosity. Once the patient is relaxed, try to bring the tibia forward. This should then be repeated on the other knee joint to compare joint laxity. An alternative is Lachman's test. This involves starting with the knee flexed to 30 degrees and holding the lower femur in one hand and the upper tibia with the other. The tibia is then drawn upwards whilst the femur is stabilised. This slide compares anterior and posterior cruciate injuries and how they may be differentiated. The stability of the collateral ligaments can be tested in many ways. Essentially, the knee ought to be bent at a 30 degree angle and varus and valgus stress needs to be applied. This can be done by lifting the patient's leg or by draping it over the side of the bed. McMurray's test can be used to detect meniscal tears. Flex the knee to 90 degrees with one hand holding the ankle and one hand holding the knee. To test the medial meniscus, apply a valgus stress, externally rotate the leg and extend. A palpated or audible click indicates a medial meniscal tear. To test the lateral meniscus, apply varus stress with the leg internally rotated before extending. This test has a poor sensitivity and can be painful, therefore it may not always be appropriate. Lastly, patients with lax ligaments are more susceptible to patellar dislocation. This normally happens when twisting on a flexed knee and the patella dislocates laterally. The knee is usually swollen and very painful and may be difficult to examine. The patella apprehension test can be performed on the other knee to assess for propensity to dislocate. The leg is held over the edge of the bed in an extended position and is flexed whilst the patella is pushed laterally. The patella may be encouraged to dislocate laterally and as soon as this starts to happen, the patient will become very anxious and the test should be stopped. Compare movements on both sides and pay attention to the patient to make sure they are not in any pain. In summary, examination of the knee involves a look, feel and move approach. Additional tests can be performed to test specific structures within the joint, such as the collateral and cruciate ligaments. Further assessment would include assessing the neurovascular status of the limb, examining the joint above and below the knee and considering imaging if needed.